Daniel 4. Four. Man, really Daniel 4.18. 4, 18. Daniel 4 is a good chapter. It's mostly practical. Um, not much doctrinal in here. Um, but uh, soon the book will have more doctrine in it than we can handle. <laughs> Daniel 4.18. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now thou, O Belteshazzar, Belteshazzar and Belteshazzar, I get the two mixed up, Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. The king has confidence in him. 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream nor the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Remind me to come back to one hour, but I'll keep moving. <laughs> let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto heaven, unto the heavens, unto the heaven singular, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all under, uh, under which the beast of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. Is thou, O king? Now, he would be feeling pretty good about himself. But Daniel doesn't end there. Thou art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reached unto, the, unto heaven and thy dominion to the end of the earth. But we've seen before that was what God intended. 23. And whereas the, and whereas the king saw a watcher. Uh-oh. A watcher. I don't know why... This happens, but you'll find certain spots where just an odd word will show up. <laughs> I sure would like to know what that is. <laughs> somebody's looking at it. That's right. Somebody's watching. A watcher and an holy one coming down from heaven. Now, the question is, the word and, is he repeating so you understand what a watcher is? Or is it an addition to the watcher? Good questions. And... Do what? Sure. It could be, that could be how he explains what a watcher is, though. A watcher and holy one. So he could be watching and being holy. Mm -hmm. Could be a watcher of like a, uh, the stars or something, too, right? Yeah, Would, well, I, yeah, we're all guessing. <laughs> no, but Came I mean, down from because heaven. they're so, you know, superstitious. Mm -hmm. I would think, you know, and they were into a lot of astrology back then, you know, it's just, that might, it could be, I'm just saying. Oh, from, from the king's point of view. Yes. Mm -hmm. And saying, hew the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with the band of iron and brass and the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beast of the field till seven times pass over him. So, he's getting something for seven. Seven is a complete number in the Bible. People like to say the number seven is perfection. If you are Nebuchadnezzar, the number seven does not sound like perfection to you. <laughs> if you're going through the tribulation, seven doesn't sound like perfection. Seven is never the number of perfection. It's the number of completion. It's a whole unit. Uh, like we say, the number does a dozen. It just means a complete or a pair of shoes, two being a pair, one pair. Uh, seven is a complete unit. For the earth, seven is their generation, the generation of the earth. Every seven years, it's to be replanted and let go fallow, so it recoups its nutrients. That's... Um, You'll find, I don't have time to go through it, but you'll find in the Bible a phrase that shows up and people uh, want to make it figurative, to a thousand generations. And they say that's just saying a long time. No, it's saying exactly a thousand generations of seven. 
Seven times a thousand is seven thousand. That's how long the earth lasts. Um, this, uh, he says, this generation will not uh, end until all these things be fulfilled. Yeah. Okay, the generation of what? A seven generation of the earth. And so the tribulation is going to last for seven years. Nowhere in there is there a unit of three and a half. There's time, times, and a half a time. That doesn't even get a name like dozen or any of that stuff to make it a complete unit. Seven is always a complete unit. If a woman is unclean, she goes outside of the camp for seven days. If she's still unclean, she stays out for 14 days, up to 21 days. It's always in units of seven. 24, I got off track. <laughs> this is the interpretation, O King, and this is the decree of the Most High. Okay, so whoever the Watcher and Holy One was, they're connected with the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King. Um, now, of course, it, it could be God's taking um, what's known in his uh, pagan mythology and stuff and using it for his glory. Um, but it, it's doubtful because God has um, already revealed himself to this man. He, he's He's aware of who God is. He says in verse 22, Thy greatness is grown and reached unto heaven. That is, he's become notorious. And all of the known world at the time was in fear of him. And so that makes him a great type of the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to be in power ruling the whole world because he's going to be an imitator of the one that's going to follow, Jesus Christ, the one who's really going to rule. And he's going to rule with a rod of iron, so the devil says he's just got to be mean since he ain't got no rod of iron. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar imitates his father, the devil. And we saw his first um, great thing he does to the Hebrew children is try to throw them in the fiery furnace. He wants to destroy the Hebrews. Now, he himself, I, he didn't come up with the plan, but he sure was um, gullible when it was brought to his attention. Yeah. John 8, John 8, verse 44. John 8, verse 44. It's going to be a short lesson, so I'm slowing down. Nobody ever believes me when I say that. <laughs> he says, Year of your father, the devil. This is Jesus speaking. Who's he speaking to? Uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, but uh, I don't have it in front of me. What's, uh, what's the context? Who's, who's he speaking to? Uh, it says of Pharisees on my title. Okay. So uh, he says, Year of your father, the devil. Does he mean it? Yeah. Yeah, he means it. Okay. So what do we got going on here? Do we have some uh, Genesis 6 going on? Their father, the devil. Hmm. When he talks about the work of your father. He he's going to, yeah, he's going to go on. Yeah. And the lust of your father will you do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. Now it could be just saying that you're a bunch of liars and the origin of a lie comes down from the man who loves to lie, the devil. That could be how he means father. There are, you'll find people who will make that into the seed of the serpent is what it's called. Uh, it's a doctrinal stance. I don't take it that far. I think he's just referring to their, uh, their act and their, their motive. They've self-adopted uh, the devil as their father. Uh, Isaiah 14. Um, doctrinally, that was before, um, like in Romans, it talks about whoever you yield your members to. I mean, that's like a precursor to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. His servants, you are. Mm -hmm. This is uh, this is more than servant, though. This is an actual family relation. Mm -hmm. um, 
but here I think it's the same as well. It's not a, it's not a, it, it, their bloodline was not, you couldn't cut them and get a DNA of the devil out of it. Well, they really love to brag about we're Abraham's seed, mm -hmm. you know, and Christ yeah. is like, you're like the devil. He slapped him out the head. devil. But what about the son of perdition? No, the son of perdition is, um, well, I don't have time to do that one either. <laughs> the son of perdition is Annie, is uh, Judas Iscariot, and I believe he's reincarnated, brought up from the pit. Um, and there, I believe, the devil inhabits him just like he did when he was on earth. When Judas was on earth, three times it says Satan entered him. So he has a habit so of... Generational passed down. Well, yeah, yeah. Wouldn't there be a seed passed down just like there was, you know, with Christ? Because he's such an interpreter, he's such a, he's such a liar that you know, just like he's a lion, he's a lion, and you know, he's he's always trying to, um, you know, be do everything that Christ did. Yeah. So why wouldn't he have a seed? You know. Yeah, yeah. He's got a seed. Um, as far as people adopting him as their father and following his works, he's also going to have um, some beasts that come up and some that come down. Uh, we, we'll get there when we get there. <laughs> the miry clay mixed with iron. They, they'll uh, mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they'll not cleave the one to the other. Okay, so there's something that's not human that comes in and mixes in the final kingdom. And it's not a human thing. It's uh, reminiscent of Genesis 6. Um, there was a progression, going back to Judas, with Judas, where it wasn't immediately Satan entered into him. It's like he had free will choices along sure. the way. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, just like we do with suggestion, you know, that comes to our mind. Are we going to refuse, refuse it or are we going to go along with it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it distinctly says three separate times Satan entered him. So the question is, what happened in the meantime? Obviously, he left him. He left him if he, if he had to enter him three times, then he didn't dwell in him. He, he was like the Old Testament Holy Spirit would come on someone and leave them. That was what was going on with the devil as far as Judas is concerned. And then, of course, when he dies, he goes to his place. And then Judas, of course, had no children as far as uh, is recorded. So we don't know of any birth line. Mm -hmm. um, so there is an unholy spirit there. Correct. Moves. Mm -hmm. Forces. Yep. Forces. Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, 13. Here's the spirit of Nebuchadnezzar at the time when he's declaring him to be this great big tree that's covered the earth. It's uh, reminiscent of his father, the devil. Isaiah 14, 13. For thou said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. It's reached to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. He says, I won't be the most high, no, no. but I'll be like it. <laughs> Do you want to be like something? Do you want to be the knockoff? <laughs> That's what he's claiming. Right. He says, you know, I'm going to be a very good imitation. I wouldn't sign up for that. <laughs> he's set up as um, the symbol here in the plain of Dura. He's put his, uh, his, um, his image up here. And he wants everybody to worship. It's going to be a large image, and it's like the tree is exalted. He's going to exalt his, his uh, form. He's not getting it. Um, every time God says, when you get big, I knock you down. <laughs> but it's just not going through. If God doesn't reveal a thing to you, even if he interprets it to you, if he doesn't reveal it to you, it goes right over your head. That's why when you're witnessing to someone, the most important thing is the prayer. Yeah. Yours, not theirs. That's right. That's right. You want the Holy Spirit in the room, not you. Because right. you could say all the right words and make everything plain and simple as far as everybody else would be concerned. But if that individual, the Holy Spirit, doesn't open their understanding, they don't get it. Isaiah 42.
Now he said in our passage in Daniel that uh, his, um, he's reached to the end of the earth. Um, and people like to say that means that uh, the Bible has an error in it because they didn't know about America at the time. So how could he have reached over there? <laughs> and what, you know, all the earth, what does he mean by that? Well, obviously it's the known world. Um, but it goes way beyond that because it's prophecy. So in prophecy, it literally reaches to the end of the earth, circles the globe. Isaiah 42, verse 10. He says, Sing unto the Lord a new song and uh, his praise from the end of the earth. Ye that go down to the sea and all that is therein and the isles and the inhabitants thereof. Okay, so the ends of the earth in their mind is the sea. So that would probably put them all the way out to Spain. And they, of course, didn't know about America. That, that took some... Um, I was just researching this. I gotta shut up. I, I was just researching this. You know, Columbus, when Columbus set sail, he set sail when uh, Spain had um, banned the Jews from their country. They kicked them out. And everybody that sailed with him was a Jew. He did that. He himself was a Jew. And so he did that to save the Jews. Hmm, the ones he could. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? Uh, Zechariah, Zechariah 9. Well, they were highly motivated. Yeah, they were. <laughs> we're going to find a spot or we're going to be dead when we get back. <laughs> Zechariah 9, verse 10. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth. Okay, so as far as they were concerned, it would be the Tiger and Euphrates all the way to the Mediterranean. That's what they're seeing, and that's uh, within... Um, their soldiers reach as far as uh, Mesopotamia was concerned but as far as God's concerned it's every sea and they all meet up and touch and he says I'm taking it all <laughs> basically where the lands and the sea begin it's all God's and in our passage as far as man was concerned that was here it was Nebuchadnezzar's he had everything um the farthest reaches is the way we say it. The farthest reaches of the earth. And that's exactly what's going on. Daniel 4, look at verse 25. From sea to shining sea. Mm -hmm. From sea to shining sea, that's right. Verse 25, And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. Okay, so that's exactly what the Antichrist does. It's the Antichrist and the beast. And they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. Oxen. An ox is the face, a cherub has the face of an ox. Um, that's why all the way through this uh, Baal worship is such a big thing, because that's an ox. It's a, a, a bull, a Bashan. And they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven. Seven times shall pass over thee till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And whereas thy, uh, they commanded to leave the stump of the tree root, uh, the stump of the tree's tree roots. Seems like a wordy way to say that. <laughs> thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee, after that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. That is, there's something above your head that's in charge of this, not you. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee. Great formula right here. And break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. So if you get worried about it sometime, which you should all the time, that you got too much sin, then do this formula. Quit it. <laughs> but it's more than just quit it you have to take the next step go help somebody find some poor people and help them it's important to know some poor people sometimes you've been the poor person and people have had to help you 
You know, it's just as equally hard to receive help as it is to give help. Yes, sir. Sometimes I think it's harder. <laughs> yeah. Try washing someone's feet. Yeah. That's right. How that goes. That's right. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's more to the verse than just that. If you notice, sometimes you don't have peace. This is the formula for peace. He says, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. So if you need peace, try the formula. Uh, all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, uh, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. So it's been a whole year. At this point, he's probably thought, okay, I got away scot-free, no big deal. Uh, but all that did is made him feel secure in being stupid. <laughs> and that's what happens to man. We think we got away with something. Yeah. And so we think, well, we can do just a little bit, a little bit more ain't going to hurt nothing. Mm -hmm. It's all adding up. Verse 30. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the, king, of, uh, of the kingdom by the might of my power, and for the honor of my majesty. Too much my in that. <laughs> 31. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. Uh-oh. The kingdom is departed from thee. Now, it took how long for him to get the big head? One year. And it took how long for it to leave? Immediately. <laughs> That's the way God does business. We may get away with something for a long time, but when God decides that it's over, it's over. He that being often reproved and hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed. That without remedy. 32. And they shall drive thee from men. That is, all of his retinue has turned against him at this point. Now, that's quite a thing if you really think about it. Here's the powerful Nebuchadnezzar that everybody quakes in fear of. And now his court has turned against him. They would have never tried that before. Well, it had to be God behind it, or else they would never have lifted one finger against him. He says, And thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. Who's making him eat grass? It's not the court. It's not men. It's either the beast or it's God, the Holy One and the Watcher. Uh, uh, shall be the beast of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it unto whomsoever he will. God's a very merciful God. Here God has, is not destroying Nebuchadnezzar he's punishing him but the punishment has a purpose and when the purpose has been accomplished he's restored so if you get punished if you have to take a little chastisement take it it's only going to be until God has accomplished what he intends and you come out better he's going to come out way better for it verse 33 the same hour this is twice we've seen the mention of one hour. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair, uh, hairs were grown like eagles' feathers. That's quite some strange looking hair. <laughs> Could you say frayed ends? There it is. <laughs> and his nails like birds' claws. A lot of fowl in this. The fowl of the air always uh, in the Bible is a reference to evil spirits. He said the decree of the watchers there in verse 17. If you drop down to verse 24, it's the decree of the Most High. So it's, a, it's an angelic host for sure. And the watchers may be a um, delegation, like you could say angel in the generic, but be meaning seraphim or cherubim. Um, and there's classification. So um, that watcher and holy one could be a further classification of the host of heaven, the high ones. Uh, so as the devil has um, permission to do whatever God allows him to, he does not have the permission 
to just do all the development that he wants. People think that it's a constant struggle between God and the devil. It's not God's always in charge. And God will tell the devil, okay, I'm going to let you go this far, but don't go any farther. And that's all he can do. Even in the tribulation, he does not get to run rampant. There he's been given a line he cannot cross. And that's as far as he can go. Um, God doesn't bring his trouble uh, to anyone, righteous or unrighteous, unworthily. Nebuchadnezzar, he told him exactly why he was doing this to him. You got pompous, boy. I'm going to show you something. I'm the one in charge. So think about that the next time you're asking yourself, am I going through this situation because this or that? And you'll do that. Things will happen and you'll say, am I being chastised of God? That's a good question to ask. But then, you know, the devil can use that too. Because sometimes you're not. Sometimes you're being trained by God. That's right. Not chastised. So you ask yourself, God, is this something I've done wrong and I, I need to repent of? Show it to me. And if he doesn't, don't keep sulking. <laughs> that, that'll be of the devil. God, if God's going to punish you, he wants you to know why. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So just like with Nebuchadnezzar, he's no good guy. But even here, God says, here's why, buddy. And here's how you fix it. Go ahead, act like a cow. <laughs> he says, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Not you, Nebi. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar thought he was the big mighty king. We saw it. Three times they changed out the hierarchy in Egypt. And all the time he's thinking he's the one in charge and he's setting up this kingdom. He does it twice in, uh, in uh, Judah. He replaces the kings. But God says, no, you don't get to replace them. I do. Matter of fact, I'm going to show it to you firsthand. Uh, judgment against Nebuchadnezzar is that he's made to be turned into an animal. And according to the beast, it's a, it, or according to the passage, it's the beast. Which that wording is important because when you get to Revelation, it's the beast that is the terror of the world. Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28, verse 14. Ezekiel 28 is a, uh, another passage that you need to know. It's, uh, it links with uh, Isaiah 14. It's the, the um, pre-world. <laughs> Lucifer, when he's running the globe. You're right. It starts out with the prince of Tyrus, and then he moves on to king of Tyrus. This is a formula God does. Because he's holy and righteous and long-suffering, when you do wrong, you probably don't get punished immediately. So when you're getting punished, it's been coming for a long time. Uh, <laughs> what he normally does is he gives a man a space to repent. That's right. Here he's done it in our passage. This went from the prince of Tyrus to now he's been promoted to king of Tyrus. If you compare them, it's the same accusations of both against both. I think it's the same individual repeating and continuing in the same problems. And the individual is the devil himself. Ezekiel 28, verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub. He would not say that about a man <laughs> that covereth. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mount of God. Thou hast walk up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. That is, you've been in the lake of fire and been given the permission to walk up and down and throughout it. And uh, a cherub is a, um, is a uh, creature that has this ox face. He's, he's a beast, an animal. Get it in Ezekiel 1. Ezekiel 1 will be in verse 10. Yeah. Ezekiel 1.10. I'm trying 
trying to get you something else. Um, <laughs> Okay, 110. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion, on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, and they four also had the face of an eagle. Okay, so you've got all of these uh, human representations embodied in a being, faced, uh, four-faced animal being, whatever you say, <laughs> in heaven. So that shows you there's things in heaven or vice versa that represent one another. And of course what's missing is the serpent. <laughs> the serpent is, was represented, but he's gone now. The serpent is now still a serpent, but he's no longer the covering anointed cherub. He's that old serpent is how he's referred to in Revelation. Look down at verse 4 of. Uh, 14. Ezekiel, no, go to chapter 10. Ezekiel 10, 14. Ezekiel 10, 14. This is the difference in a seraphim and a cherubim. Ezekiel 10, 14. And everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. The second face was the face of a man, the third face was of a lion, and the fourth face, the face of an eagle. Remember the eagle claws and the eagle uh, hair that he had? Mm -hmm. He's lining up here as a uh, supernatural being, although he's not really a supernatural being, but the imagery is being painted for us. And it may be that he, I say that he probably was no longer a human, Something happened. I, I don't think a man could do this. Have a heart transplant to an animal? Could you have an animal heart put in you and still keep pumping? I don't know. That's what happens to Nebuchadnezzar. God gives him a little heart surgery. And a beast heart is put in there. And when he's restored, he gets back a human heart. Um... Look at um, e Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, verse 2. Now he was told that he's going to be out there in the field until he realizes the heavens rule, not him. Now the heavens. It, it's interesting that he didn't say that God rules. He said the heavens rule. That is, there's beings, man's put a little lower than the angels. Not all angels are good angels. Some of them are bad. But they're still more powerful than humans. Luke, uh, Ephesians, Ephesians 2, verse 2. He says, Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That's heavens the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That is, there's something so powerful that it forces even disobedient children to worship it and to follow its commands. That's something. People gravitate toward their kind. The devil is the prince of uh, the king over all the children of uh, rebellion. I didn't quote that right, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Children of pride, there you go. And so a proud kid's going to line up with the devil, just gravitate right toward him, even though he won't obey anything anybody else has to say. <laughs> He'll fall right in line with him. That's because there's a power up there. The, they don't used to. Power lines were always run over your head. Now they put them through the ground so you can get shocked when it rains. <laughs> Look... <laughs> Luke 4, Luke 4, verse 5. Luke 4, verse 5. Now, I know what it says. It's clear, it's plain, but we're going to put our thinking cap on. And the devil taketh him up into an high mountain 
and showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Okay, so there's something supernatural going on here. First of all, that he takes him up into this high mountain. Next, that he shows him all the kingdoms of the world. Not just a kingdom here, but all the kingdoms. And he does it in a moment of time. Okay, so they're probably out beyond our atmosphere. That's the heavens. They're way up above. And they're looking down and they're seeing all this in a moment of time. And that's the, the representations probably up there. You'll find in Daniel, we'll hit it later, where you have the prince of uh, Grisa and the prince of Persia. Okay, so there's heavenly representations of what's going on down here on this earth up there in the heavenlies. And he says, that's a more powerful thing going on up there than down here. Hmm. It, uh, look at uh, Ephesians. No, let's go back to Isaiah. Isaiah 24. Isaiah 24, 21. And we think, why didn't God just destroy all the wickedness? We're looking at it at the wrong point of view. We're looking out here as wickedness. There's a wickedness that's above our head. How come he hadn't gotten that one? <laughs> He's got a timing for it all. He's making it work for him. Isaiah 24, verse 21. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host, that's an army, of high ones that are high that are on high, and the kings of the earth upon the earth. That is, when he really gets to going to, to town and doing business here, he's going to start it out where it ought to start, from the top down. <laughs> and it comes down to earth. Uh, look at Daniel 10, Daniel 10, verse 13. Daniel 10, 13, he says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one, uh, one in twenty days. That is, Daniel's been praying, uh, and his prayer was heard, and the help was on its way. However, it got um, sidetracked, got into traffic to him. <laughs> the prince of Persia withstood me one in twenty days. Below Michael, one of the chief princes, okay, so... These beings are also referred to as princes up there. Below Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. So there's something in the heavenlies that carries these titles, kings, princes, as well as uh, the names we know, seraphim, cherubim, uh, and then we've seen watcher and holy one. Daniel 10, verse 20. And he said, no, uh, Knowest thou whereof I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. So there's all of these um, nations that are uh, within the same realm that he's in there on earth in, in Babylon. And he knows about them and he's telling him there's a representation of it in the heavenlies. And probably that's where all of this mess comes out with the, with the crazy gods they worshipped and the mythology that they serve, right. is it's being whispered in their ear from something much higher. And it's not just some phony baloney. There's some truth behind it and some power behind it. It's demonic, though. Uh, not, not something that we should be following. Daniel 4, verse 34. And at the end of the days, of, uh, and at the end of the days, I Nebuchadnezzar lifted up mine eyes unto heaven. Okay, so the end of days meaning after seven years, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored Him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom is from generation to generation. Nebuchadnezzar's been through the treatment. God gave him the seven-year punishment. And it's not until he lifts up his eyes and says, Okay, I know 
exactly what you were trying to tell me. <laughs> Let's not go any farther. <laughs> and this is showing when you've got understanding. If you have a clear mind, it's natural to praise God. If you're not praising God, your mind ain't right yet. <laughs> Keep eating like a beast. <laughs> now, here's Schofield's notes on this. I like them. <clears throat> he says uh, there's a progress here to um, Nebuchadnezzar's um, apprehension of the truth. <clears throat> in Daniel 2, Daniel 2, verse 47. The king recognizes God as, um, here I'll read it to you, Daniel 2, 47. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods. Okay, he still doesn't have it quite, but he's getting there. And a Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, seeing uh, thou couldst reveal this secret. So the first step he's got is a God of gods. Okay, we're, we're getting there. There's something different than what he's used to, but he doesn't have a clear understanding yet. Look at 3 verse 28. 3 verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay, he's connected to the Hebrews. It's a Jewish God. That doesn't sound like much, but right now, well, from the time they were created till the end of uh, the tribulation, the Jew is always going to be on the outs. And it's not until you get to the, tribula or the, the millennium that you find where the Jew is exalted. There's one other place where he's exalted, but it's temporary and it's faked. In Revelation, he says, <clears throat> you've found them that said they were Jews and are not. They're the synagogue of Satan. So something happens there in the tribulation where God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We all know that. You've read that a million times in your Bible. Maybe not a million, but <laughs> it's in there over and over. And so it's his nation that's going to rule this earth. The Jew is going to rule. He's not going to be numbered among the nations. He's going to be head, head and shoulders above them. And so the devil comes in as a mimicker, as an imitator, and he tries to exalt the Jew and give them some, some position that other people envy. I think what it is is the thing that's gone on in America where they say you are a... Uh, dis, disenfranchised race um, and you are owed reparations you know if they start giving um, the black people reparations I'm going to start being black I'll self identify <laughs> cut me a check I think that's what's going to go on in the tribulation they're going to say okay the people who have really been persecuted is the Jew and that is true and so everybody's going to sign up to be a Jew. And that's just going to multiply the, the guillotine basket. <laughs> and he says what's going on in that mix is also the synagogue of Satan. So there's going to be evil spies sent out to collect the Jews and intermingle with the Jews. They're all going to want to sign up and tell the government, I'm a Jew, give me my check. And when they do that, they get uh, registered. Just like you find all the way through, Herod uh, put out a registry for the whole world to register to be taxed. Here the taxing is the world's going to do the tax, get the tax, and the Jew's going to get the check for a little while. And then he's going to get the guillotine. <laughs> now the last time in Daniel, Daniel 4.34, here he's got the right idea of who God is. Daniel 4.34. He says, uh, mine understanding returned unto me, and I bless the Most High. Now that's getting there. He's still not there yet, but he's about to get there. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever. Now that's something bigger than his gods, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. That is, it's something 
beyond what we've ever thought up. 35. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. That is, he's over everything, and it wouldn't matter how big you become, which was what the dream was about, a big tree. It didn't matter how big you become, he's over it all. And he doth according to his will, here's something special, in the army of heaven. Now, we're... I don't have time to go into it real into heavy detail, but you can look it up. <laughs> what he's done here is he says, I saw into something supernatural. <clears throat> there was an army in heaven that forced me out here in the woods to eat grass. A supernatural. His whole thing was he was going to be like that until he knew that the heavens, something above him, plural heavens, ruled in the affairs of men. And now he's saying there's armies in that heaven. There are. And God does what he wills with them. He says, And among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Now that's a great king saying, I ain't the end of the story. There's somebody way bigger than me. Uh, and then uh, Darius has pretty much the same explanation. I'm not going to read it to you. In 625 to 27, Darius comes up with the same conclusion. And that's our God. We'll end it there, um, and we'll pick up next week at Daniel 435. Daniel, well, we just covered it. Daniel 436. Daniel 436.